Over the Hedge, a computer animated feature film produced by DreamWorks Animation and distributed by Paramount Pictures, released on May 19th, 2006 in the US and on June 15th, 2006 in Australia, and starring Bruce Willis, Gary Shandling, Steve Carell, Wanda Sykes, William Shatner, Avril Lavigne, Eugene Levy, and Catherine O'Hara, among other acclaimed actors. Spring is sprung, and Vern, played by Gary Shandling, and his woodland friends awaken from their long winter's nap to discover that a large green hedge has cropped up right through the middle of their once natural habitat. Enter RJ, played by Bruce Willis, an opportunistic raccoon who explains that the world beyond the hedge is the gateway to the perfect life, where peculiar creatures called humans live to eat, rather than eat to live. For humans, RJ proclaims, enough is never enough. This is coming from the archived website for DreamWorks Animation, which features the film's official synopsis. But today we're not going to be talking about our furry characters here, because as the title of this video suggests, the Verminator from Over the Hedge was misunderstood. Why? Well, let me explain. The Verminator, also known by his real name, Dwayne Lafontante, is a hardworking pest exterminator, and will do whatever it takes to get the job done. Some might say he's a little too passionate about his work, given how ready he is to gloat about his education, as well as utilizing his strong senses to detect and find wild animals. Oh really? Do you in fact have an associate's degree from Vermtech? I think he wants you to think he's dead. But I beg to differ. The Verminator is played by Thomas Hayden Church, who you might recognize as the actor who played the Sandman in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3. Just a little fun fact there. Dwayne is hired by Gladys Sharp, the president of the Homeowners Association, played by Allison Janney, who resides in the suburban neighborhood that the story primarily takes place in. After she sees our main protagonists on her front lawn, catching wind of a supposedly rabid squirrel, having some of her food stolen and her neighborhood trashed, she calls in for any exterminators she could find. And soon, we're introduced to the Verminator. Now, we're led to believe that both Gladys and Dwayne, aka the Verminator, are the villains of the story. But again, I beg to differ. And here's why. You see, the Verminator is a man who, while at times, is a bit extreme with his approach to catching the neighborhood pests with whatever tools he has at his disposal, he still plays by the book. To our knowledge, for the most part, he's following state laws and regulations in order to perform the job adequately. But Gladys, however, is willing to do whatever it takes for things to be perfect in not only her neighborhood, but also for the welcome party she's planning, even if it means violating the Geneva Conventions to have the animals removed from her neighborhood. She doesn't just want them removed from her neighborhood. She wants them executed, and for them to suffer the most inhumane treatment possible upon their eventual capture. If anything, I don't see the Verminator as a villain in this story. Simply put, he was doing his job, but even with Gladys' attempt in trying to gain power and control over him, he wasn't willing to go through great lengths to violate the Geneva Conventions like what Gladys wanted to do. Meanwhile, Gladys was sadistic and unhinged mentally in her mission for a perfect neighborhood. With the power she wielded as the president of the Homeowners Association, she was willing to do anything in her power to achieve the authoritarian power and rule she desired to have. Not only over her neighborhood, but the organization as a whole. She wanted to see the animals suffer for the property and vehicular damage they had caused. She wanted control, and I don't think it would have been far-fetched if she wanted power over not just the animals that surrounded the area, but also power over the people in her suburbia. The neighborhood and the organization, in her eyes, was her sandbox. But for Dwayne, even with the trials and tribulations he endured in order to catch the animals, remains level-headed and professional for the most part. At least, until the end. Also, Gladys fucking booted a possum down a set of stairs. Ah! Heather. In all honesty, I don't understand how that didn't kill it. That was a powerful kick. Still fucked up, but still pretty fucking powerful. Anyways, back on track. All in all, Gladys was the true and definitive villain of the story that ultimately tried to drag Dwayne down with her. And the reason why I say tried is because Gladys wasn't the one that caused the Verminator's downfall. It was Dwayne himself. What ultimately led to Dwayne's downfall in the end was letting his inner Texan get the better of him by installing the Depelter Turbo, 
a contraband item that the Verminator's services provide that is illegal in every US state except Texas, the Verminator's home state. He was so proud of his home state to the point where he was willing to unleash the power of Texas onto Gladys' neighborhood as a means to get the job done and rid the neighborhood of all the animals. With Gladys going along with it, pleased that the power she had over him was working to her benefit. Like Ken from the B movie, there's no denying that the Verminator had his major faults that played a part in his downfall. But with everything I've talked about today, I don't think the Verminator was a villain. He was a victim in that he let his pride for his home state get the better of him. He was the victim of manipulation and the victim of having too much pride. And ultimately, in the end, he would end up suffering a fate far worse than death. Never mind, that cop elbow dropping Gladys looked painfully powerful. Hashtag Dwayne's Texan pride? Never mind.